Hey everybody, welcome to our show number 100 here on this Monday, November 12th. I had to think about that. It was not a long weekend. Uh, big news today, Brad Rogers, President and Chief Operating Officer of CanTrust Holdings today announced his resignation from the company. In an exclusive interview with yours truly, he said he was taking some time to spend with family while simultaneously getting ready to develop additional new opportunities in the exploding U.S. cannabis sector. We'll be staying tuned to see what Brad Rogers is up to next. Also this week, there's going to be multiple announcements from companies with, um, on their financial statements. Kicking it off was Aurora Cannabis announcing their financial and operational results for the first quarter of 2019. Highlights include an interest, an increase in quarterly revenue to 29.7 million, up from two, up 260 percent compared to the same period in 2018. Aurora is now producing 395 percent more product and selling 201 percent more product compared to the same period in 2018. They now have eight facilities with production licenses and six facilities with sales licenses around the world. Since October 17th, Aurora has launched more than 450 SKUs across Canada available to the adult rec market. The company's brands accounted for approximately 30% of the total market supplied through the Ontario Cannabis Store. And Aurora is the only LP supplying a vape-ready CBD oil cartridge to the market with Aurora Cloud. Planet 13 Holdings Inc. also announced their earnings report today for Q3 2018. The company opened their superstore in Las Vegas, Nevada on November 1st, 2018, which is already servicing an average of 1,300 customers a day. Their medicine dispensary generated $4.9 million in revenue in Q3 2018 and $12.9 million in the first nine months, growing at 6% monthly compound rate. Monthly online revenue is also growing at a compound rate of 8.3%. Oxley Cannabis Group, Inc. announced their financial statements today reporting a loss of 4.5 million or two cents per share up from a loss of seven cents per share in the same period last year for the three months ended September 30, 2018. The company has 237 million in cash and cash equivalents which should aid in funding Oxley's streaming partners, wholly owned subsidiaries and downstream distribution efforts. The increase in cash is attributable to the companies raising $215.1 million in debt and equity financings, as well as $95 million from the exercise of warrants. InMed Pharmaceuticals reported their Q1 fiscal 2019 financial results and provided an R&D update. During the quarter, InMed made advancements with their INM 750 program for the treatment of epidermolosis bullosa. The company demonstrated that the cannabinoid components in the INM750 formulation each play important functions, including anti-inflammation and keratin upregulation, by completing two types of bleh, completing two types of genotoxicity studies. InMed has also entered into service agreements for biofermentation development and scale-up processes for cannabinoid biosynthesis in E. coli allowing the company to move closer to being able to produce multiple pharmaceutical-grade cannabinoids on a commercial scale. Through these advancements, InMed recorded a comprehensive net loss of $2.8 million compared with a comprehensive loss of $1.8 million for the three months in the same period last year. The primary reason for the increase in losses was an increase in non-cash share-based payments in connection with the grant of stock options, which was $1.4 million for Q1 2019. New Strike Brands Limited, wholly owned subsidiary Up Cannabis Inc. received their license from Health Canada to commence sales of product cultivated at its Niagara facility. Pure Leaf Holdings Inc. announced they've opened their 15th medical dispensary in Florida. This dispensary includes the community's first medical marijuana drive through The company now has 30 operational dispensaries across the United States. Yep, unbelievable. Brad Rogers. Hitting the highway on the old can trust. I mean, uh, it, 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 he was the CEO. He was the president and the chief operating officer for okay. a while, but then he gave up the chief operating officer. There's the new CEO. Yeah. yeah. And uh, looks to me like probably can trust is uh, going in a different direction than Brad wanted to go, maybe. I don't know. That's all speculation. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. the great news is. Brad has got a couple of interesting projects, and so there's going to be some new opportunities coming through that channel. And in the meantime, CanTrust is going to continue to 
power forward. I yeah. mean, it sold off dramatically, as has everything here. But I guess it's in the in in an air in you know when we have a new sector, like the last three years, basically we've got a new sector. What the cannabis sector? Cannabis sector. <laughs> I you got to expect a lot of M and A activity. M and A. Lots of personnel moving around, right? Because it's a mushrooms and acorns. It's a uh, fertile landscape. Mm, fertile. Fertile. Verdant. B verdant. Fecund. <laughs> I you know I know what that word means. <laughs> fertile. It means fertile. Fecund. Fecund is fertile. Fertile fecund, is fecund. fecundity. Yeah, like fecundity. You know, yes. Yeah, we're not supposed to. Like the Catholic Church says you're not supposed to interfere with the natural fecundity of the human. Species. In other words, mm. birth control is illegal. Mm. Anyway, well, that makes easy perfect for them sense to, to me. Yeah. Well, if okay. the uh, strategy of the life force is to just proliferate without control until we're so populated, then a you know god-driven meteorite hits the planet and disperses all our DNA into the you know solar winds of time until the next fecund oh. ball of matter happens to pop up across from a sun-like orb, then, uh, then that makes perfect sense. But if it's not that, yeah. we are just uh, insignificant, you know, accidental biological manifestations drifting along on a piece of dust in time until we get destroyed by unknown forces. You, you remember Carl Sagan, right? I remember Carl, yes. Carl, he and I used to drink together. Carl, yeah. <laughs> Carl said we were a, uh, we, 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 we lived on a moat of dust suspended ah. in a sunbeam. Huh. That's a moat, an interesting. The earth, right? The earth was a yes. moat. Moat, yeah, a moat bolt. of dust, bolt. Bolt. suspended in the sun. I thought like, that's very poetic. It it's, is poetic. You know, depressing is all hell. Eh, why? It implies that we have no here sort today, of, gone tomorrow. No autonomy, no self determination. Here today, gone tomorrow. Here today, gone tomorrow. Anyways, uh, no, no. So, so look, there's all kinds of opportunities. Look at look at the the, the fellow from uh, High Hampton got uh, got to, his position changed to. He's the CEO, and Christian's now the CEO. Things are changing. Things are in a state of Things flux. Things are moving around, yeah. Uh, yeah, High Hampton, they announced also they made that acquisition. They of, finalized uh, that. Mojave Jane. I like that name. That's got promise. Yeah, yeah and you know, now, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't, uh, doesn't Aurora have a fairly big interest in, the, in High Hampton? I didn't know that. I think if you go back and scroll the news items, you'll see that they've... And I maybe I maybe that's, you know, are you suggesting this is something we should be buying? I, I you know you know what I think you got to go look at the press. Let's we should what I should do tonight is I should pull out the two or three press releases uh -huh, uh -huh. that look to be germane. Okay. And then then maybe we can discuss it and and yeah me me because the market cap is virtually nothing. Uh -huh. If they've got they've got an edible they've got uh, they've got acreage they've got this they've got that. Okay. Blah blah blah. Maybe blah, there's blah, a blah. maybe there's a pop. All right. Um, let's talk to Ben. Ben Smith, our uh, our ace writer, our editor in chief, editor at large, ben. is uh, going to join us now. Though I've just noticed that I don't have a transceiver to listen to what he's saying. I just I don't have any pants on. <laughs> I, oh, I've got pants on. I remembered that. Um, no transceiver though. No transceiver. What about a transponder? Transponder. That sounds despondent. But, well, that's what they you have to have to travel the ETR, a transponder. Oh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. You can always, uh, you know, pay pay per diem rate. Your, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so halted. By the way, halted. Another, by the way, huge, huge. Yeah. Yes, I know. I just spoke to uh, Anthony Durkatch on any, the phone. Any any uh, pearls of wisdom there? Mm, no. You got to wait for the press release. Which shall it's not like we can be disclosing news before it's been released publicly. Hey, Ben. Hey, Ben. Nice to see you, young fella. What's the news, nice Ben? I feel like I know you now a little more intimately because we did a show together. Yeah. Yeah, so, I feel like I've known you my whole life, Ed. Can't hear you. I can. Okay. <laughs> but, hey, you know what? I know what my, 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 my status is here. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Hey Ben. So, anyways, uh, tell me what are you what are you seeing in this sell off here? What's your thoughts? Well, you know, I, I think the sell off is it doesn't really have anything to do with earnings today. Um, you know, I think a lot of people thought that earnings might be uh, might come in play and exert an effect on the marijuana industry, but um, 
I think it's just more in line with this sector sell-off and the general weakness that we're seeing in the broad markets as opposed to anything that uh, you know came out with ACB, which by all measures seem to have uh, you know hit their targets and they did pretty well. So, hmm. interesting. Okay, so what do you see in the terms of opportunity in this sell-off? Well, I think uh, there's a good opportunity for long-term investors to perhaps get in at prices that. Uh, perhaps they didn't think were there would be available, um, you know, a couple months prior. So, you know, the, the sector has been hit pretty hard recently, and now valuations are getting to a point which, uh, you know, some long-term oriented investors might think about, uh, you know, perhaps diving in here. I mean, we have six dollars. You know, uh, Can Trust Holdings has. Uh, gotten raked through the coals over 40% in the last few days. So there's some pretty good uh, deals out there for people who are focused on long-term uh, results. Yeah. So what do you make of the big ones like uh, Tweed, Aurora's results were out today, Tilray's, uh, you know, rocking along. Are the big guys demonstrating any sort of general market direction? Uh, not that I can tell, James. I think it's mainly, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's any specific news in the cannabis industry that's really affecting market prices right now. I, I think a lot of risk assets are, are generally getting raked by the coals. And now after that nice rebound that we've had uh, last week, things are sort of defaulting back to the broad market uh, direction, which currently is down. Uh, so... Yeah, you know, risk assets are getting hit and a lot of things are getting hit right now. And I don't know, as long as the market continues to be weak, yeah, I'm not sure that risk assets in general, uh, be it cannabis or other sectors, will be, you know, necessarily, uh, you know, performing well in the near term. Hmm. So do you think this uh, sort of weakness in cannabis is, you know, somewhat related to the weakness in commodities, the weakness in the broader markets, the fangs, the tech, everything's looking a little sickly right now. I have a question, uh, if I could chime in here. I can't really hear Ben, unfortunately, because uh, you've, you've taken away that uh, privilege from me, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Ben, on that same matter that, that James was just bringing up, like if you look at the S&P chart and you look at a daily, uh, and you look at that, that, that unbelievable correction we had, it looks like it could be the big, it looks like a reverse head and shoulders over the last, say, three, four weeks. We had a, a drop. And you, all you got to do is put up an SPX and look at uh, a three month chart or a six month chart. You can see it over the last uh, fact. And so, so if that holds, it, it should garner, it should, it should, uh, garner well for everything else too no i mean but if it that breaks everything else is at, at risk no like to some degree i mean we'd like to think that some markets can move independent of others but it's all kind of tied in to some degree isn't it yeah I, I do think it's tied in to some degree um in terms of chart patterns in isolation it's not something I would look in without uh, analyzing the, the price action along with actual chart patterns them, themselves. But I think when you boil it all down, it all it comes down to the broad markets are still weak. Uh, there was a, uh, some might call it a dead cat, cat bounce and strength over the last few sessions which sort of elevated all boats. Of course, MJ uh, post legalization was down you know, uh, 35%, 40%, a lot of individual names are down 50%. So um, a bounce was inevitable and we've gotten that. And over the, you know, now things seem to be, you know, defaulting back to uh, the broad market uh, indexes, which are going down. And that's what's exerting the influence right now. So it's not even cannabis earnings. Even as we saw today, uh, Aurora Cannabis has great results and uh, they're executing on all their strategies from everything that I've seen. And I chimed into the conference call. Uh, things look great, but you know, it's not being rewarded by the market right now. It's it just, um, you know, what can you say? Risk assets uh, are in favor uh, over the last couple of days. So. That's what's exerting the influence at the present time. Looking for the pencil becomes sharpened and people are looking at more ratios and things like this. And where's it's a safer place, I think. 
Yeah, I didn't catch the first part of the question, Ed, but um, yeah, you know, it, it, when, when the market's very weak, and I'm not sure we've, we've break, broken technical levels on the broad indexes just yet, that would uh, signal, you know, acute danger. But when they do, you can kind of throw those technicals out the window in terms of RSIs and MACDs and things like that. Um, so, you know, today is one of those days where things are selling off and we're down to like, a, I believe, a six or seven day low on on the Nasdaq index. And, you know, things are pretty dicey out there. There's war in Israel and, and everything like that. So there's a lot of, you know, fear in the marketplace right now. And I think that's what's sort of taken over. Great, Ben. Uh, sorry. Do you <laughs> I was just going to say it's a suit. It's a bit of a half at holiday, too. Right. Like. Remembrance Day is a day when a lot of people take time off. Like a lot of banks are closed. You know, there's a the banks are closed. Yeah, the banks are closed. So, so that that would explain some of the leth lethargy. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. all I wanted to say. Plus, it's Monday and it's November. Anyways, Ben, we're going to leave it there for now. Thanks very much for joining us. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Uh, if you've enjoyed the taste of craft beer. Over the years, you've probably uh, seen craft beer, uh, you know, maybe you've switched from a mainstream beer to a craft beer because craft beers have more to offer. But uh, what about craft cannabis? Sean Cookson has this story. They're your friendly neighborhood, independently owned beer makers that focus on quality, not quantity. The craft beer market has exploded. They have some of the coolest names around. Nota Hop, Drop and Roll, Green Flash Palette Wrecker, Foothills Brewing Sexual Chocolate, The Alchemist Focal Banger, or how about Half Acre Daisy Cutter? I decided to ask a brewmaster what all the hubbub was behind these crafty hops. It's about the creative process, I'd say, for me. Um, I love the idea of creating styles that don't exist yet, or augmenting styles that do exist in ways that, are, that haven't really been thought of yet. I think buying local is a huge thing that appeals to people. People like the, the creative element of craft beer, and I think that sort of dabbling, that experimentation, really drives a lot of demand. The question is, will the profitable desire of craft barley carry over to craft bud? I would give it a shot for the taste. Uh, if there is a taste relevancy in there, um, then for sure I'd give it a try. Post-legalization headlines have been dominated with news of mass-scale growers licensed to meet Canada's cannabis demands. But some might argue that it's the craft growers that built the industry. Who do you think came up with some of your old favorites? Blue Dream, Diesel, OG Kush, Pineapple Express, Super Lemon Haze, and the list goes on. All these strains were created by breeders, cultivators, craftsmen, if you will. And the doors may be opening for these underground cultivators and others with the introduction of micro licensing, which will allow them to continue to grow and sell to a lesser yet significant market. Everyone from current, you know, gray market growers that kind of want to go legit um, to people who have you know, no uh, experience or knowledge of cannabis or interested in becoming micro-licensed. A lot of farmers who, you know, want to either add cannabis to uh, what they're doing already or they are maybe tobacco growers that want to, you know, get rid of tobacco and replace it with cannabis. Literally every walk of life, uh, every background, people, business owners, average people, there's just a lot of interest and that's been one of the most interesting things for us. A lot of the licensed producers are interested in getting deals with micro license holders um, to either be able to resell their products or maybe do research on their products. It's just going to be really a, an endless um, future landscape. So it looks like the future is pretty bright when it comes to craft cannabis, not only for potential businesses, but for consumers like you and me. For Midas Letter Live, I'm Sean Cookson. And in the spirit of craft growers everywhere, we are going to talk to Mark Spear now. He's the founder of Burnstown Farms. Mark, how are you doing? I'm great, James. How are you? I'm great, thanks. So you're getting ready to launch a 10-acre outdoor production facility in Beckwith, Ontario, is my understanding. 
Correct. We plan on being one of the first commercial outdoor producers in Canada. Interesting. So tell me, how is the outdoor license different from the uh, standard licensed producer? So we still are applying as a standard uh, cultivator of cannabis. The primary difference is, of course, that we're producing outdoors, uh, no walls, no roof. Uh, so that's substantially different than a greenhouse or an indoor grow. Mm -hmm. uh, so the SOPs are a bit different. Uh, some of the sanitation requirements, of course, are a bit different. But uh, in general, most of the standards are the same, especially from a security point of view. Hmm. Okay, so tell me, there's a, a general perception out there that you could never grow as quality a plant or, or as high a grade of THC as you could at an indoor environment at an outdoor one. Is that the case or would you argue with that? There is a lot of debate around that. Um, I, would, I would argue that. A lot of the cannabis that's been grown in Canada and people are familiar with um, has been produced by the black market. And these are often gorilla grows. So these are unattended grows in which people go onto a piece of property, often not their own, and put clones in the ground at the beginning of the season and come back at the end of the season to see uh, what, what made it through. Uh, these are not sophisticated grows. They're not well tended. And generally, they produce relatively low quality flower. It is, it's also true that many parts of Canada are generally unsuitable for outdoor cannabis growth. Um, the season's too short, the fall is too rainy or too humid, um, but that isn't the case in Ontario. Ontario has an excellent um, environment for growing cannabis. Uh, it, it's very similar to the requirement for grapes, and southern Ontario is, is booming as far as wine production, and uh, that has moved slowly north over the years, and there's a number of wineries in this area as well. So. We are somewhat limited in the strains we can produce. Uh, they have to be short flowering strains, um, but we have no problem pulling off an eight week strain in this region. And uh, that's the average length uh, for most commercial varieties. Mm -hmm. So in terms of uh, THC content, uh, what is the relationship between THC content and uh, the environment you grow in? So, there have been a number of studies done, um, some of them informal, of course, but there generally is a correlation with higher cannabinoid content and the sun versus artificial lighting. Um, so the sun certainly provides a, a more broad spectrum than any uh, horticultural lighting available today. So we do expect to see relatively high terpene contents as well. We're gonna be growing all organically and um, higher terpene content is associated with organic fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, I'm looking at uh, all the pictures uh, of you growing cannabis out there. What is the process to get licensed by Ottawa for growing cannabis outdoors? Is it any different from the traditional LP? Uh, it's the exact same process. Okay. There's there's really no difference. Um, some of the, the consultants we're working with, I mean, this is new to them as well. No one is entirely sure what the regulator is, is looking for in terms of security or SOPs. Uh, so we're really doing our best at, to ensure that we do meet all of the requirements and in certain cases exceed. Um, but it, it's really anyone's guess as to exactly what will be accepted and um, what what won't. Sure. Do you think that there's a strong argument that craft growers will always have uh, a, a share of the available market just by virtue of being a craft grower and all the things that that implies? Absolutely. I don't... Uh, there's certainly been some issues um, with production, especially with some of the bigger operations, um, bigger production space, bigger problems, and it can be a real challenge to deal with those at scale. Uh, we do see a large opportunity for independent, smaller producers in, in Canada. It's really been a booming market for the craft brewers, and uh, we think cannabis lends itself to 
to local small batch production even more so than beer. Yeah. Okay. Do you think? Uh, do you think that? Do you think that uh, craft growers are going to be the feedstock for the um, large cannabis companies in terms of how they grow through acquisition? I'm sure there's there's going to be a lot of that. Um, some some of these smaller growers are are opposed to the idea of being acquired by a large conglomerate. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. It it will also be difficult for these smaller producers to turn down um, a large buyout. But uh, I do expect there to be quite a large proportion of them will stay independent for some time to come. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does the fact that you're kind of coming to this whole marketplace late and in what, you know, you might consider a disadvantaged position by virtue of the fact that you can only grow outside. Does that concern you at all about your ability to, you know, be viable economically? Not at all. Uh, we wouldn't consider ourselves late, uh, really. In the grand scheme of things, the industry is really just getting started. And uh, myself, as, as well as num a number of the members from the team, have worked for other LPs in indoor and greenhouse environments. Uh, so we're very familiar with producing under the ACNPR and the challenges of it. Um, we are going to be one of the first outdoor producers. Uh, so we, we don't really feel that we are late to the game. And we're going to be growing a product that's highly competitive to the, uh, the extracts that are available today from the large LPs at a fraction of the price. Okay. Are you targeting recreational market, the medical market, or both? We're really more interested in, in medical. Um, that's how I got into the whole cannabis industry in the first place and where we see the most potential to, to help Canadians. Um, so medical is, is certainly our interest, but being a wholesale extract producer, certainly some of our products are going to end up on the recreational market. But I myself don't like to distinguish between medical and recreational use. I think everyone that uses cannabis does get uh, some medical and wellness benefits from it. You wouldn't say you only eat oranges because for fun, um, there's no such thing as recreational oranges. You, you get the medical benefit, the vitamins, all the nutrients from them at the same time as enjoying the orange. Hmm, that's an interesting analogy. Um, it's taken a lot of growers, or rather applicants for LP licensing, up to three years before they've actually achieved licensing. Um, what do you think is your timeline going to look like, and why do you think that? That's, that's really anyone's guess. Um, we're, we're hopeful that we'll be in production next year. Um, it's really hard to say what what the likelihood of that is there's health canada has certainly added a lot of staff to the license approval process in the last 18 months they've tripled it the rcmp has doubled the number of people required to review security applications so we do expect the process to get faster and there's there's certainly a lack of supply at the moment so um, health canada is certainly motivated to get more product to market and outdoor production can scale up uh, much faster for less capital than an indoor or greenhouse producer. Uh, so we are hopeful that we'll be in production next year. Um, there, there's, there is the possibility that uh, we won't be able to grow a plant until 2020, though. Okay, interesting. Well, that's great, Mark. Uh, I'm going to be following you with interest. I see we follow each other on Twitter. Uh, if you want to follow uh, Mark Spear from Burnstown Farms, he's on Twitter at Burnstown Farms. And uh, we'll hope to come and visit you with our crew once you've got crops in the ground next year. Great. We'd love to have you out there, James. Great. Thanks, Mark. We'll talk to you soon. I'm not sure that these, the expectation that you're going to get a license in time to grow next year is going to work for Mark and his guys. But, uh, you know, they've all got exposure. They're all known quantity to Health Canada. So theoretically, that should cut down the timeline. But personally, I'm really excited to try some outdoor organic pot you know because for me who doesn't like the super potent stuff that gets you all goofy high it's like well that's that's what us old farts like to smoke you know what i'm saying there edward 
So, so you think it could take longer than a year to get a license? Uh, well, I'm just going off the experience of a number of growers with whom I'm affiliated or I have, a, have knowledge of their process and their, their curve. And in some cases, it's been over, it took three years. Three years. So now, now you got to ask yourself, has Health Canada, who's still driving the regulation licensing bus, have they had enough of a upgrade in terms of human resources and staffing and procedures to accommodate now the flood of growers who are going to come in under the recreational regime? That's an interesting question, which is one, that's a mission for our friends in the Four East Media Department. Anyways, we're looking right now at the Midas letter Canadian Cannabis Indices. And okay, well, let's uh, take a peek. We can see that <coughs> uniformly they're down and they're, they're not down as much as they were earlier today as we had for the close in half an hour but they're yeah. they're still down one to three percent in the case of the CSE index uh, as is normal it's either the smallest cap indexes that are going you know down the most or the large cap this t today looks like the large cap is where the recovery is beginning most profoundly uh, if we look at the index page uh, we can see that weed is now in the green. Weed was down a couple of bucks earlier today. Weed was down. Uh, Kronos is now in the green. Wheat Kronos was down earlier today. The stream just cut randomly, so we're gonna put it back up. 